by all means, just uh, just flag me down. Um, with that, uh, I will call this uh, meeting, call the April 14th, 2020 Special Committee, the whole meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. And acknowledge that we are meeting on the shared traditional lands of the Salish people. We are gonna do a uh, roll call. Um, and Councillor Baxter, you're here. here. Councillor Day. I'm here. Uh, Councillor Jansen. Present. Councillor Kobayashi. Here. Uh, Councillor Parkinson. I'm here. And Mayor Martin. Here. Thank you very much. Uh, looking for a recommendation to adopt the agenda as presented. Just raise your hand. Moved by Councillor Kobayashi. Uh, any discussion? Not seeing any. Uh, those opposed to the motion? Seeing no opposed. Uh, the uh, agenda is approved. Uh, there is no uh, public that uh, no speakers have registered to speak. And we will go on to item four, uh, new business, 4.1 tax rate review 2020. And now I'd like to invite uh, Alan Thomas, our uh, Chief Financial Officer, to introduce the item. Alan. Thanks, Chair. We're just uh, making sure we get rid of some feedback here. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Chair, we're just making sure we get rid of feedback here, trying to get this Sorry. trained up. Okay, I am going to, um, Amanda, share the screen for the presentation. Do I do that, Amanda, or you do? No, you would do that on okay. your end there. Thank you. How does that look? Looks great. All right. Excellent, okay. Sorry, everyone, give me two seconds there. There we go. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we're um, presenting the tax rate review from uh, tax rate review 2020, um, just so we're all on the same page here. Uh, again, the reason we are here is um, council direction last year indicated that the ratio of um, taxes for the business class be discussed at the beginning of the 2020 um, budget process. And although we're not at the beginning, we are in the budget process at this point. So um, what I have done is I have taken that direction and today we will look at the tax rate um, policy and the process will be as follows. Uh, an oversight of tax policy principles will then review the business uh, tax classes, including an assessment of the tax ratio and the tax burden, review light industrial and recreation NPO classes, um, have a quick overview uh, of the residential class. But again, that's more for reference and comparative purposes. It's not a, a deliverable from, uh, from council's request. And then we'll look at options for addressing potential uh, inequalities in the business tax and the light industrial. So we're gonna start with the um, tax policy principles, principles for the chart outlined in, in the draft um, document I've provided. I won't go over them all, but just wanna talk about a few uh, key principles here. Namely, um, looking at how we can set tax rates. Uh, a couple of critical ones are the horizontal equity and the vertical equity. In the horizontal equity, it's, it's, a, it's a situation where taxpayers in similar positions, i.e. the same type of properties, are all treated equal, as opposed to the vertical equity um, uh, concept where tax is based on ability to pay. In other words, you charge more to those can afford it. And another key one I think um, pointing out here is the benefit equity where the tax burden is distributed relative to benefits received. In other words, basically, uh, user pay. So those are these sort of top level principles. In our case, I think we need to look at external considerations as well, as that may be the key to Callwood um, if we do want to address our, uh, our regional differences. So as a city, where do we sit in terms of assessed values? 
as you can see here, the residential um, assessed values have increased in terms of both obviously overall value and as well as the percentage of total businesses, um, total taxes for the city. It doesn't necessarily mean the uh, burden has shifted to the residential um, uh, taxpayer because we also have to look at the mix of the amount of residential properties that have been added during that time period versus the proportion to the businesses that have been added. Um, and what we'll see there is residential assessed values are up about 1.5 billion versus business, which was higher in 2010 due to, um, my understanding is the, the gravel pit valuation back then versus, or until, of the, until it depreciated, um, or until the value, the assessed value went down. And subsequently we're basically down over the 10 years or up slightly since 2011. One of the things I want to point out here is if you look at the total of the residential versus the business, it's about 99.7% of our total tax rate. So what that means is that if we do any adjustments in the rec nonprofit light industrial utilities, um, it won't have a material impact on the other ones. And secondly, if we do any adjustments in the business class, it'll pretty much have to fall 100% to the residential class because the other ones uh, are simply too small an amount to absorb any of that burden. So let's move into the um, business tax class ratio. So this is basically the amount of our business tax uh, rate divided by the residential tax rate. And per um, our city's economic development strategy, and I'm gonna quote the above, the city is at a competitive disadvantages, disadvantage when it comes to property tax rates for light industrial and business categories. And this has had the effect of deterring or stalling needed investments. Again, that was why we were charged this year with bringing back a, um, a tax policy to committee uh, and ultimately council. You can see in the last 10 years, um, the tax ratio has increased from about um, 3.67 in 2010 to 4.51 in 2019. That means we're about one of the highest in the, uh, in the CRD. And um, competitiveness, uh, as has been described earlier, uh, can become an issue based on these rates. Now, and that's the business class tax ratio. The other thing I wanna look at is the tax burden. And this is basically the percent of tax um, paid by businesses over the entire um, uh, property tax total. Again, uh, this has gone down per table 4A in the document. Um, we were about 30% in 2010. It has gone down to 20.9% in 2019. I wanna show this ratio. Um, not, it doesn't show that business class taxes are decreasing. What it shows, again, based on the assessed values, is it's mostly due to the impact of all the new residential dwellings over the last decade, because the total assessed value of the residential uh, properties is up about one and a half billion. And that's significantly more than the increase in the business, which as alluded to earlier, has actually gone down. Um, so again, um, just wanna remind you that um, any reduction in the business tax rates are gonna have an equal and opposite impact on the residential tax rates. Shall we continue? No questions. Um, Councillor Tate, did you uh, want to ask your question now? Um, my question is uh, ab about the first table that you brought up comparing uh, different municipalities and their tax rates. And I'm wondering if um, you've taken into account the fact that we all offer a different service, right? The, um, the cost of uh, services is different in each region, depending on what services are offered. In Saanich, uh, your garbage and recycling is included. 
in Colwood, uh, you pay for that uh, separately. Uh, and there's also a lot of disparity in the cost for police services, for example, um, Colwood being one of the more affordable um, areas in the CRD. Uh, so how have you factored that into your um, uh, conclusions here? Um, at this point, um, not factored in in the sense of we're just looking at um, metrics as laid out in the property tax um, values. So we need to look at the at the tax um, philosophy based on the principles, and then I can say, okay, where can I go with business class? I haven't equalized these for the differences. I've looked at different metrics to say what is our tax ratio, what is our tax burden. What is the trend over the last 10 years? So these are just different measures to look at it and are not normalized per se for any differences that you may have just described there. It's just a comparative amongst the CRD and that's why we've chosen to show a couple of comparatives so we can sort of cross reference and not just have one specific um, ratio. But again, not normalized for those differences as you've indicated. And you also mentioned about uh, tax equity. Um, I sort of uh, lost my place there, but you were specifically referring to ability to pay uh, being taken into account. And as far as I can recall, I've never seen anything available to municipalities uh, that takes that into account, ability to pay? Well, these are just principles that can be followed. Um, it's again, when, when we were tasked with bringing back a tax policy to committee slash council, um, we wanted to start that discussion with principles that, that we can follow. Um, as we said, vertical equity, horizontal equity. Some of them are, are, um, are contrary in nature. In other words, if you do A, you can't do B. So really what this was is providing an overview to committee on how we could approach our tax policy principles. From an academic perspective, again, knowing full well that um, you can't obviously satisfy all of these criteria and certain criteria are, are more applicable to, to some areas rather than, than others. So again, it's just an overview of the policy <laughs> principles versus a, um, versus a uh, direction on which one we should follow. Uh, Robert, I see your uh, hand up. Thank you, Chair Logan. The, the concept of a, uh, ability to pay or vertical equity in the municipal sense is just that a property that is worth $10 million will pay more uh, in property taxes than, than a property that is worth $1 million. And so uh, arguably a property that has greater value commercially has greater capacity to pay. And the same notion applies in the municipal context to residential property. And so that's how vertical equity um, is applied in the municipal context by uh, applying our tax rate by the assessed value. Therefore, those properties, both commercially and residentially, with greater assessed values, uh, pay greater amounts of property tax. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, Michael. Yeah, I had a question um, as to whether um, you can tell us which properties in Colwood fall under recreational or non-profit? Yeah, we'll have to bring it back. I, 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 um, I'm just talking with Jen here. Well, this specific list of properties I don't have, I would have to pull that up. But presumably we'd be talking about properties like Queen Alexandra, which is, a, I believe, a completely non-profit operation. Correct. And do, do you know whether Royal Colwood falls into that category? Um, just looking at assessed values here. I don't know. I, Councillor Baxter, I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. And um, just uh, picking up on your comment that 
any reduction in uh, business tax would be exactly mirrored, you know, give or take a very small amount in uh, residential tax. Uh, you're talking about the total amount of tax would be mirrored. But as to the individual property, a, a general 1%, sorry, general, uh, yeah, 1% reduction in business tax would actually only be a 0.2% increase for the average uh, residential property. Right? Oh yeah, yes, sorry, it wasn't, uh, I wasn't referencing a one-to-one -one relationship. What I was indicating simply was based on the assessed values um, that um, business and residential are 99.7% of the total. So there is not enough capacity in the recreation, light industry and utilities to be able to absorb any change in business. It would basically um, be 100% uh, applicable in a reallocation to residential is what I was getting out there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Stuart, I see your hand. Um, just just checking here, I don't think the presentation was complete. And if so, I'll back off and wait until we finish the presentation. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay. Uh, so Alan, uh, please continue. Yes, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. As I said, I was, uh, I'm not sure how quick I'm speaking over a computer, so I just wanted to check in and see if there were any questions. So. Fair enough. Yes. Um, so we've moved on from the business tax and we're gonna look at the, uh, at the light industrial. And again, um, you know, we had said in our economic development strategy, again, that we're at a competitive disadvantage when it comes to the rates for light industry. And, um, and it's had the effect of deterring or stalling needed investments. So again, um, light industrial is a small proportion of the tax, less than one tenth of 1%. So any change in these rates won't have a significant material impact on other classes. But if we just look at our, our um, our, our standing in, in relativity to the, uh, to the CRD average, we're about 2.7 times greater. Um, and this is, you know, most likely in impacting our investments in these areas and probably uh, needs to be, to be discussed, which we'll do over in the, uh, in the options. So um, again, just, um, just wanted to be clear of how far we are out from the CRD average and that the, uh, the materiality of this, uh, of this tax rate. And again, not much to say in the recreation nonprofit here, um, but it's similar to light industrial. We're significantly higher than the CRD average at about 2.2 times. Um, and therefore it, we need, need to review that, uh, that multiple. Uh, as I alluded to at the intro, um, I just wanna give people a quick uh, overview of residential to compare it to the business tax rates and the business tax burden. Um, the BC government puts out the average tax rate for a representative house each year. And, uh, and what you, where you can see Colwood from a residential aspect um, and how it compares in the CRD. So I think it's, um, it was just more to give a committee an idea of, you know, we're saying our business tax rates are higher in the CRD. We're saying our light industrial and recreation are higher. So where do we sit um, from a residential tax burden perspective? And again, that's laid out in section five of the report, simply for reference. Um, so now uh, we'll move to the options aspect of it and, um, and basically look at the uh, business tax rate first. So again, as laid out in the options on page six of the report, um, we can really, we have three ways to go on this. We can revise the tax ratio currently to the CRD average if we choose to do that. Right off the top, that would be a $591,000 movement from the business class tax to mostly residential. We can look at a phased program um, beginning next year, let's say in 2021, where we can bring our tax rate up to the regional average or within a range of the regional average or a West Shore average, again, open to uh, recommendations from the committee. Um, per table eight in the document, um, if we moved um, to the CRD average, it's about a $591,000 impact um, as per point one. Uh, Mr. Chair, should I go to the overview of the light industrial uh, options or do we wanna discuss the business tax options at this point? 
Uh, yeah, let's just finish off your, uh, your presentation, I think, Alan, and then we'll open it up for questions. Sounds good. Similar approach for options in the light industrial and recreation MPO tax classes. Um, if we choose to move immediately to the CRD average, it would be about 76,000 um, equivalent transfer to business slash residential tax classes. And for the recreation MPO, it'd be about 50,000. Again, we can take a similar approach with a five year or lesser time phased in uh, um, to get to these targets. But from a materiality perspective, um, that's why in, in the recommendation um, uh, 1A, um, given it's 126,000 uh, K in a shift now in the materiality of it to consider moving to that rate now um, would be what we've sort of rec what we've um, highlighted as an option in 1A of the report. Again, obviously option three for both of them are to keep current rates as is. So that's really it, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's great, thank you, Alan. I will move to uh, Stuart, you've had your hand up. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, can I just say uh, uh, what I thought that was an excellent report, Alan? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, a lot of information there, well presented. So, uh, so thanks for that. Thank you. A couple of things. You, well, where shall I start here? I guess I'll, I'll tell everybody where I'm leaning to is I'm leaning to suggesting we go back to the 3.67 business tax ratio that was in place in 2010. That's virtually the same as the CRD average today, but the CRD average is sort of a moving target every year. If we just said, if we want to take five years to get back to where we were in 2010, uh, I think that would be um, progressive and probably uh, uh, help in our competitiveness. Uh, I don't, I, I see the recommendations suggest starting this in 2021. I, I would like to see it start this year. Um, in the other areas, the uh, light industrial and the uh, rec and nonprofit, um, I think we have to adjust those. Um, I guess in both cases with the rec and nonprofit, I'm not sure what's in there. And the light industrial is just so far out of whack. I just wonder why, if anybody's got any historical information, why it was set there, if there's any particular reason or whatever. So again, I'd be happy with both of those to say, yep, need to be addressed. Uh, let's get some more information. And perhaps uh, in the next month or two, we could agree in 2021 what we want to do with those rates, but maybe we just have to live with them for another year until we get more information. Um, I think that's where I'm coming from. And then the question that I had, I think I understand this, Alan, but perhaps uh, uh, when you talk on about table eight uh, under the options, when you say a 5% reduction, is that 5% of the total business tax ratio? Or is that 5% of the difference between the business tax ratio and the CRD average? It's just the current tax rate times 0.95. So just a 5% overall reduction in that rate right now, moving towards the CRD average, which is approaching, um, oh, I'm sorry, I think the change is about 17% or something. So it's just a step to get us there. Okay. So, uh, so I'll let everybody else uh, have their say, but as I said, I'd be prepared to move that we go to the uh, 3.64 number over five years starting this year, and that we ask for a little more information on the light industry tax rate and the REC NPO tax rate before we finalize what I think are fairly uh, likely decisions on those two. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll go to uh, Cynthia. There we go, I'm unmuted. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm just wondering uh, procedurally if we have considered the option of hosting a town hall. I, I'm just very um, alive to the fact that everybody is deeply um, concerned with COVID-19 and we're doing these online meetings that people have never, you know, I'm just not sure if people are are really engaged at this point in time. And it is quite um, 
this is a big swing to be making at a time when nobody's really engaged um, with us about uh, these options. This is representing, you know, a big uh, change in the way we would do things. So is there an option to do some public engagement on these issues? Alan? Um, the, I hadn't thought through the process of that. We can always consider options, um, <clears throat> Councillor Day. Um, I have not put together any consideration of that at this point. I would suggest that if um, committee is interested in making any changes for the 2020 tax year, that uh, we probably have to make a decision uh, tonight so staff can uh, get the bylaws ready. Um, otherwise, uh, any town hall or, or any other mechanism, uh, we would have to focus on next year's plans. And I think I would want to go through corporate services from a governance <clears throat> perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I'm certainly, um, I, I've just got to say, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with moving at this uh, speed at this time. Um, I don't have a problem with uh, making a decision to go in a different direction, but I have a problem with making that decision right now. Um, there's, there is a lot uh, on the table that I... Um, <clears throat> do not feel comfortable with. Um, our ability to pay um, isn't something that we can affect, uh, yet that is in our report. We've had no input from the public. <clears throat> as far as I know, no one has uh, registered for any of the three, this being the third meeting that we've done online. Uh, I don't think people are prepared to be engaged at this level at this time and I don't think that these sorts of big moves should be being done when uh, no one's looking. Uh, Colored residents do support many businesses and there's great differences between services and how they're de delivered throughout the CRD so just saying that we need to go to the CRD average doesn't work for me. There's a huge difference in the costs uh, for providing the same services. Um, you know, Esquimalt is probably the closest in size to Colwood, and uh, you know they their um, tax requisition is uh, at least twice what ours is for police services. Um, so I think that. <coughs> Everybody plans their financial future based on uh, that, you know, there aren't going to be big swings. Uh, and so undertaking this now without really any education for our public or input or opportunities for them to um, say what matters to them, uh, I don't think is really fair. Uh, to the residents in terms of um, they're, they're just not uh, prepared for this in any way. So I'm all for supporting businesses locally, uh, <clears throat> but I'd like to support them uh, in a very measured and careful way because uh, it, it's going to have big impacts on people uh, who are already struggling with everything that's coming at us uh, uh, in, in the very near future. Thank you, Cynthia. I'll recognize uh, Mr. Earl. Uh, thank you, Chair Logan. Part of the reason uh, that you see the, in the recommendation that you have before you tonight, that if council is desirous uh, to uh, change the, the business class ratio, um, which, is the, which is potentially a material change, is our recommendation was uh, that that begin not this year, but in the following year, uh, 2021. That gives the municipality a year uh, to have those communications um, and staff can begin the process of that five-year phase in. That said, as council is aware, 
uh, tax rates are something that are set annually. And so it would create a, a very deep opportunity for rich and meaningful public engagement. The other two areas of recommendation, the recreational nonprofit rate uh, and the lead industrial rate um, are both as described in the report and the presentation um, fundamentally not as substantive. And so the collective impact per dwelling, if both of those changes were made, um, would be in the neighborhood of $15 annually. And so administration was of the belief, uh, given council's desire uh, to support projects um, that are currently underway um, at uh, developments such as Allendale in terms of their capacity to attract uh, possible tenants, that these changes could be accommodated um, in a way that's uh, much easier given the, the materiality of their impact on the residential class. Thank you. Uh, I recognize uh, Doug. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Earl, you stole my thunder. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I looked at this as, yeah, this is not an immediate uh, implementation. We have a year to actually uh, take it to the public because I, I agree with you, Cynthia, we certainly don't want to uh, impose this. Uh, you know, there's gonna have to be a lot of public discussion about this. <clears throat> it's uh, the whole paper, Alan, that you created was excellent, lots of data. And I found out how difficult this was to try to compare apples to apples. When I tried to analyze this a couple of years ago and I went, wow, this is a bigger issue than I thought. Uh, I think one of the more important tables though, uh, is, is probably table six, which is the, uh, the taxes and charges on a representative house. So my question, Alan, is, is there a, uh, do they have that sort of uh, comparison in the CRD for businesses? Because, you know, you, you take a thousand square foot coffee shop here, for example, a thousand square foot coffee shop in, in Esquimalt, for example, and uh, then, you know, of course, they, the, the, the total tax burden is you know, the mill rate times the assessment value. So to, to get that apples to apple, that's probably the closest you're gonna get. Uh, I know there's another, uh, a number of things that, that go into that burden, but do they, uh, my question to, to Alan is, do they have a similar um, comparison like that on a, on a typical representative business uh, between, the, uh, between the municipalities and the CRD? Uh, I haven't been able to find a comparative chart like that. I think um, back to uh, Councillor Day's request is there has to be a little bit of normalization of right. the overall rates, but per a typical business, there's been nothing I've seen um, that would align with that, no. Okay, so I, I'm, uh, I'm supportive of uh, Councillor Parkinson. We have to start this discussion at some time. And, and to me, this is the problem that we normally get is that we, we don't, have enough notice to actually discuss it and then everything happens in a short order but we're giving ourselves a full year to to have all the proper discussion so i think it is appropriate to uh, discuss this at this point in time but, and i do support his recommendations thank you thank you doug i'll uh, recognize michael you're muted michael <laughs> All right, a couple of uh, small points about um, Councillor Parkinson's remarks. Uh, at first, you said the target would be 3.67, which was our business tax ratio in 2010. And then I think you mistakenly said 3.64 the second time. I'm assuming that you intend 3.67. But <laughs> what I would ask you to provide us with is what information um, other than the obvious discussion of public input, what other information is needed uh, in order to discuss the light industrial and the recreational uh, nonprofit? Uh, moving on to the point about the public consultation, I would point out that in the last 10 years, the rate has swung from 3.67 to 4.51 with no public discussion whatsoever. And now that uh, we're asking to swing it back to where it was, um, now we have public uh, discussion. That, that seems incredibly unfair, uh, well, to the businesses, quite frankly. Uh, 
and uh, I think what we should be concerned about is the fact that this swing from 3.67 to 4.51 occurred with no discussion, not even at the council table. Um, further, I would say that a year ago, I brought this up, more than a year ago, and um, we were told, well, we can't discuss it um, till next budget time. And there was a resolution saying it should be discussed at the beginning of budget time. And this is not the beginning of budget time. Uh, now I understand all kinds of reasons why this may have occurred, but what it amounts to is that there's been more than a year's delay in even starting this process. And now we're counseling uh, a year's delay before it might go ahead. I don't think this looks very sincere to the businesses. We spend 10 years raising the rate, and as soon as we want to lower it, all of a sudden there's a lot of delays. Um, I'm for beginning the swing this year. It won't be a big impact on residential. if It's spread over five years. Then we can go to the public and we can uh, revise it the following year. But uh, I think we need to indicate that we do intend to do something to address what's been done to them in the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I will now recognize Dean. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, there's a lot to take in here. Um, it's very clear to me that uh, we need to do something with these taxation rates because they are inconsistent uh, with our uh, neighbors, which does certainly create uh, issues of competitiveness or perhaps uh, businesses that choose to, that, that are migratory in nature and can uh, up and move to a neighboring community to save a few bucks, uh, I wouldn't blame them. So I, I agree with uh, Michael to some extent that I would like to see us move on this. Um, as far as uh, our current time period here and the issues with communicating uh, with our public, and I, I, I see it maybe slightly different is like, we are here to act on behalf of our community. And I do believe that we do need to show leadership and we should be taking some action. And that's not to hide anything or uh, you know, to obfuscate, but it certainly, uh, I don't remember people showing up uh, you know, to protest uh, tax reductions, which is what we're looking at here. So I think the risk is minimal in that regard. But uh, so I do believe that something needs to be done. Uh, the sooner, the better, um, at least, the beginnings sooner the better. Um, I would agree with Michael that I'd love to see something start happening this year, although I think this is going to be a difficult uh, budget season as uh, I'm sure we're all we're all aware of. So uh, those are my comments. I am support uh, in, in support of Councillor uh, Parkinson's motions uh, as he's described them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'll just uh, remind us that there isn't, isn't actually a motion on the table yet. But uh, um, I'll be looking for one uh, PDQ. So I've got well, my, uh, my my interpretation. He used the words that motion and described uh, what he wanted. So uh, I would argue that he did present a motion. Um, it just wasn't seconded, maybe at the time. No, there's no seconded uh, seconder required at committee. But uh, I didn't take it that way as the chair. But uh, he's certainly uh, able to make a motion when we when we get back down to him. Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Chair, may I? Alan, yes. Yeah, just to be clear, um, um, I heard the word tax reduction. I just want to be clear, this would be a reallocation amongst tax classes and not an absolute reduction. Um, yes, for one class, it would be a reduction, but neutral overall. overall. Thank you. Fair enough, thank you. Uh, Mayor Martin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm not going to repeat what everybody else has said. I guess the, the thing that I would like to reinforce with everyone, though, is that this isn't just about um, businesses that are in the community today, but it's about attracting the business for tomorrow. And, um, you know, without divulging anything, I clearly uh, things are still in camera, but uh, you know, there are projects that are looking and comparing Colwood to other residents or other communities. And I know I have had individual discussions with each of you about that. And I think it's important that we realize that we are going to be in a hyper competitive market 
when COVID-19 is over and that when we start to see money coming in from the provincial and federal governments, when we start to see growth, th this is going to be one of the determining factors of if our community is successful compared to other communities within this region. And so I would really uh, want to reinforce that with each of you that we need to be thinking about that. And if we're thinking about the long-term success of, of the city of Colwood, this will eventually actually increase revenue to the city, not decrease revenue because you, we will see it an overall um, capture of more tax revenue coming into our community if we are competitive. If we're not competitive, I, I, we, we will struggle, um, pure and simple. So I just wanted to reinforce that part of it. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, recognize uh, Cynthia. Uh, you're on mute. <laughs> there we go. There. We are speaking here tonight about the split in taxation between uh, business and uh, residential. Um, so, and, and I'm not, I don't wish to argue in, in any way. I just wanted to point out that uh, a number of comments have been around how to support businesses in Colwood and what's happened with their tax rates for businesses over the last 10 years. But if you look at table six um, and look at the taxation for a representative house in Colwood between 2010 and 2019, uh, a residential has gone from 2,925 to 3,751. So um, businesses are certainly not alone in having experienced um, uh, increases in taxation. Uh, residents are also experiencing that. And the, um, I guess what I'm looking for, I want Colwood to do well and there to be lots of opportunities for employment in Colwood. Uh, and what I've seen in the past has been a number of these classes um, have had, you know, um, good rates for, for a number of years, uh, but they haven't necessarily had a lot of employees. Uh, that are being supported by those rates. So I would be very interested in seeing us look at um, some other mechanisms for supporting and drawing businesses to Colwood uh, that look uh, at tax holidays or uh, options for, um, you know, if you bring X number of employees, you get X number of uh, reduction for X amount of time uh, to actually target what we're trying to to actually uh, get in Colwood rather than it simply being if you're in this, this tax category, you get this deal. Great, thank you. I'll recognize uh, Stuart. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair. Um, a lot of good discussion. A um, couple of the points. I think, I think um, you know, your initial comments, Cynthia, about how people are struggling and stuff like that and how we have to be uh, mindful of the residential taxes we're paying. Uh, I, I believe that'll be a fulsome discussion later in the evening when we get into the financial plan for the year and the overall budget. Um, here, I think what we're doing is just trying to, uh, I guess, be competitive, rectify some inconsistencies in our tax ratios. And... Um, uh, I think I think as Dean says, uh, you know, we're elected to show some leadership, and, and I think this is absolutely the correct way to go with the spin-off benefits the mayor uh, alluded to of, of being more competitive. So uh, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, Michael uh, caught me out. Uh, I I do think we should set the set the target rate in five years is 3.67. That's what it was in 2010. Yeah, chasing a CRD average that moves around every year is just too complicated for my small brain. Um, as to the uh, reason that I was prepared to delay the uh, light industrial and uh, nonprofit and uh, recreational 
uh, things. Um, again, it's just you were. Cha I'm changing something that I don't understand. I don't understand how call whatever got to a point where our light industry rate was 32 compared to an average of 11. It, was there any rationale for that, or it just seems bizarre to me? I guess I'd kind of like to know what the thinking was at the time before I changed it. But uh, and again, just what's included in the recreational and nonprofit were just matters of interest to me. Uh, probably for those reasons, it'll make sense to uh, maybe split this into three motions. And if we're ready, uh, I'd be I'd be um, prepared to make a motion that we uh, move to a business tax ratio of 3.67 over the next five years, starting this year. That'd be my motion. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a motion on the table. I will uh, look for discussion. And Michael, I'm going to lower your hand. Um, so if you want to speak on this motion, please put your hand back up. And Michael, you're first on the list. And you're still, you're muted. <laughs> I just wanted to speak in an unmuted fashion um, <laughs> to the issue of the fact that residential taxes have gone up and business taxes have gone up. Absolutely true. But uh, some numbers that um, I analyzed in a spreadsheet, which I'm happy to share with anybody um, after the meeting, um, in time before uh, next meeting, is that the ratio of the total percentage tax collected so in other words, the percentage, the ratio between the percentage of the total tax collected that business pays and the percentage of total assessed value that business is, that ratio has increased steadily with just one small blip over the last 10 years. So the actual dollar per assessed value um, has obviously increased, but the ratio between the percentage that business is paying compared to the uh, percentage of the assessed value they are, they are has gone up. Whereas for residential, it has been remarkably steady for 10 years. Um, uh, in 2011, it was 0 0.83. And in 2019, it is 0 0.84. That's pretty steady. For in business in um, 2010, it was 2.82, and uh, it's now 3.69. So this is not the business tax ratio. This is a different ratio, but I think it's the actually the most important ratio. What it says is that business taxes have gone up more quickly than residential taxes. And again, without any discussion. So I'll be supporting Stuart's motion. Thank you, Michael. I'll uh, recognize Mayor Martin. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I can support this motion uh, just from a standpoint until I have staff answer this question for me. So staff, can you please tell me the difference between the motion that is presently on the table in comparison to the recommendation that staff be directed to return with a five-year phase program beginning in 2021 to bring the tax tax business tax rate to the regional average i will need to understand the material consequences to to the motion in comparison to what staff is recommended recommending can you tell me what that would be in, yeah in terms of starting this year for the next five years, um, it, it would basically be a straight line um, move from zero to the 591,000 mares. So your impact this year would be 120-ish in your shift from your business tax rate to your residential tax class. I, I, if that's what you're asking, if I was clear. So through the chair, so I could I please I so what I want to clar clarify is is the staff recommendation would would basically be a reduction of one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year in income um, that would be a burden that would basically be put onto the other classes which we've already identified that ninety nine percent of that class or ninety seven percent of that class is residential 
compared to the motion that is on the table right now, which would be a consequence of $590,000 to residential. Is that correct? Uh, correct. The original recommendation was yes, to start it next year and move uh, one fifth of the way there over five years. Correct. Yeah, so I, if that's the case, I can't support the motion as it presently is. I believe it needs to be here. I don't believe that, that as we get into this further, into this, we're going to be looking at opportunities to reduce our tax rates for our residentials. And we're going to be putting ourselves in a $590,000 hole right off to begin with. If we look at that, I'm comfortable with doing a phased approach of 120,000 through the five years. Um, but I'm certainly not uh, uh, interested in doing that all in one year. Rob, my, uh, I might interject. I, I believe Stuart's motion was to phase it in over five years yeah. starting <laughs> this year. I if by your face, then I'm I'm comfortable. I what I heard that was that it was, it was three point uh, that we were getting into it in one year. Uh, okay. So correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Stuart, but uh, I took the motion as a staff be directed to return with a five year phase program beginning in 2020 to bring our business tax rates to the to 3.7 percent. Okay, thank you. If it's a phased approach, then I'm supportive. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's. Uh... That's correct, Cordy. I think I think okay. that uh, there's minor differences whether we go with five percent or, or just a straight line thing. I, the straight line thing works well for me. I think the big difference that others may wish to discuss is I think the staff motion called for it to start in 2021, and I'm suggesting it should start in 2020. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I recognize Dean, and then uh, I don't see any other speakers. I'll have a question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm going to support this motion, but uh, in, in, in hindsight, uh, Stuart, um, I, I think our uh, discussions about this year's taxes are going to be extensive. And I just wonder if we should uh, extend that uh, to starting next year uh, to make our, you know, to, to not overcomplicate our discussions about this current tax year. I throw that back at, uh, at, at the mover, your worship, or uh, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, while he ponders that, I'll uh, go to Doug. Uh, I was, uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Logan. I, I uh, definitely agree with what you said um, because I'm not supportive. Well, we'll get into that next discussion about tax increases for, for the year. And because of the very, the very principle that I'm going in there with right now, I wouldn't be supportive of this happening this year. Um, I, I don't think we need to add any more expenses for this year. Uh, it's going to be a challenging year. So I, I, I was more supportive of, of starting it in 2021 per the original recommendation in the, in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael? I would just like to point out um, that we're not adding any expense to this year with this motion. As, um, as the director of finance said, we are, we're just transferring it to a different part of the budget. And it's certainly possible in setting the tax increase or lack thereof to offset this increase. This increase is, is quite small and uh, could easily be offset for the residential people uh, for this year. Thank you. I, uh, I too will be supporting the motion. I think uh, we, we, we need to finally put our money where our mouth, mouth is and um, recognize that our small businesses are, are suffering and their employers as well. And they employ some, some Colwood residents and it's, it's important that we, uh, we do support them. We keep talking about it, but now we need to action it and never is going to be a good time. Um, so, so I will be supporting it. So with that, uh, I will be asking people that are opposed to the motion to, um, to raise their virtual hand. Okay. So Councillor Day and Councillor Kobayashi are opposed to the motion. So the motion passes. So I am looking for a, uh, a recommendation regarding the light industrial and recreational tax rate. Uh, Councillor Day, did you?
I just um, for for everyone's benefit, could we stick to one method of calling the vote rather than using the virtual raising your hands? I I, I would far rather that you uh, asked for who is opposed. I, I did ask for who's opposed. Yes, but you asked virtually, so no one can hear that who's watching from the public. And that's why I uh, I was verbal when I said Councillor Day and Councillor Kobayashi had opposed the motion, so the public knew. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I, I'm I actually stuck up my hand because I wanted the uh, motion reread, please. Oh, I'm okay. trying to figure out what year it's starting here. So the motion was that staff be directed to return with a five-year phase program beginning in 2020 to yes. bring our business tax rates to the to 3.67%. Okay. Thank you. So the motion did pass. Uh, Mayor Martin. Thank you. Uh, I will just make a motion that staff be directed to return with light industry and recreation tax rates that are or below the average of the industry. So we do have a motion on the table. Uh, discussion, uh, Stuart. Oh, okay, I was, uh, that was up there before. Um, you know, I'm neutral on this. As I said, it's more a curiosity thing. Uh, it, it's just, it's such a, 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 an outlier. They, they, the um, light industrial rates are 32. I mean, they look ridiculous when you look at everybody else's in the region. And I have to have some faith in past councils to think they did them for some reason, which I'd kind of like to understand. Um, not a hill I'm going to die on. Die on. If everybody's happy with it, that works for me too. I, I think we will end up changing them. Um, so uh, I guess I really don't have much to say on this. I'll, I'll support the motion as the mayor made it. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia. Thank you. Um... I will be opposing this motion and not because I disagree with it particularly in, in the outcomes, but uh, I really do not have faith in these averages um, whatsoever. Uh, there, it, it is not apples to apples. You can't, uh, I've been through this six ways from Sunday uh, at different times for different reasons where we look at similar sized municipalities, but um, we are not all the same. We offer different services. And, and I think um, looking outside of Colwood at the average of what other people are paying has very little to do with what our situation is here in Colwood. I, I understand its applicability to uh, businesses who could choose to operate in a different location, uh, but I, uh, I just, you know, I do not support this way of comparing ourselves uh, when we're, I would just like to deal with facts that are true and verifiable in Colwood. Um, so for that reason, I, I will be uh, opposing this motion uh, because we, we need to talk about our history and our truth and uh, not the way it is uh, somewhere else in the CRD. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further hands, I will uh, ask for those that uh, are opposed to the motion to raise a virtual hand, please. I see Councillor Day as uh, uh, opposed. Therefore, I will, uh, the motion passes. And there's a th third one that staff be directed to return with a draft tax policy for uh, consideration. Alan, I'm, I'm assuming that that's still appropriate. Sorry, Ed, yes, that's... Um still appropriate we'll bring it all back great thank you um mayor martin i'll make that motion okay uh any discussion no. uh let me just clear these hands here <laughs> raise hand yeah. doug do you want to speak yes please okay, i thank saw your you. hands yeah thank you yeah thank you very much mr chair uh uh, the only reason I'm going to oppose this is because I, I don't even understand what this is. 
so I don't know what I'm voting on because I, I really don't understand what recreation and, and nonprofit tax rates. And until I understand that, I mean, it, you know, because my feeling right now as I look at this and I think we have a, a lot of NPOs here and they don't pay the, the, the best rates anyways, and uh, if, if, if at all. And so uh, I'm, I'm just uncomfortable voting for something. I'm not too sure what's in that class to tell you the truth. So are you speaking to the motion that we've already passed? No, no, just the, on, we're talking about recreation and nonprofit, right? So we've just passed the motion that uh, staff be directed to return with light industrial and recreational tax yeah. rates that, that are, okay. I'm talking, uh, so the new motion is that staff be directed to return with a draft tax policy for our consideration. Oh, okay, sorry. I thought we were talking about recreation nonprofit, no? We, did we jump that? That, uh, that was included in the motion that uh, Mayor Martin had made earlier that we just passed. Okay. Uh, Cynthia. Thank you. Um, just for clarity, um, our, our entire discussion here tonight has uh, revolved around um, averages with with the CRD and uh, other municipalities who have a completely different set of services that they offer. And we've talked about um, the properties in specific uh, classes without having those particular properties identified for us. Uh, so I don't feel that everyone is aware of all of the um, possible um, repercussions of the decisions that are being made here tonight. So perhaps we could uh, get some further clarity on that. Oh, Councillor, Councillor Day, you kind of faded out there. Oh. She looks frozen. You're frozen. I wonder if you've lost your, uh, had an internet uh, interruption there. Maybe we will, um, uh, Robert, let's, uh, let's hear what you have to say. We'll see if Cynthia comes back. Uh, thank you, Chair Logan. The idea behind the tax policy is to have council to articulate um, the type of information and the type of direction uh, you would like each time your tax rates are brought before you. And this would allow council to describe, for example, if you would like to compare services um, between municipalities or attempt to compare services between municipalities, or if, if there are comparisons outside of the capital regional district that you're interested, and or if there are particular tax classes where you would like to understand the scale of businesses um, or the number of businesses in each of those classes. And so with the policy administration would have greater information about the information that you need as an elected body in setting these rates each year. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Martin. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and I, I guess uh, through the chair, I guess I'll direct this with staff because um, I know this question was asked before and I, it was my understanding that when we we're talking about, for example, the, uh, uh, the light industry and recreational, uh, that only represented about $76,000 of income for the city. And I'm just curious if that is, is that correct or is that not correct? I'm just, uh, just checking this to mirror. It's uh, 
76 thousand yeah. for light industry and another 50 thousand for recreation nonprofit. Page seven. Sorry. Yeah. I, sorry, Chair, if I can just, I'll yeah, just, just like, well, I'll continue to look for that. I guess what my point was, and I'm going to go with Councillor Kobayashi's uh, numbers that they were correct. Um, so on a $20 million budget, you know, if we're talking about $76,000 worth of, of tax revenue that would be in under that class under light industry, I don't think it's a significant uh, um, thing that we need to be looking at, especially when we look at comparison to what we would, would have the opportunity to be attracting into our community and the amount of revenue that will be brought into the community through a taxation at a lower rate that will be attractive to, to, uh, to this class. And I think that's one of the things that we need to uh, continue to, to uh, focus on is that that revenue of $76,000 could be exponentially much larger um, if we were able to be attractive um, to, to certain projects um, that I know that other municipalities are also chasing. Thank you. Uh, Dean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think there's a lot that's been said already, but I mean, I see this motion that we are seeking information and uh, we are seeking some direction and some comparisons. And what are those comparators? Um, and I would love to, to hear what staff have to say. You know, I am interested uh, in some comparisons beyond the capital region, as the uh, CAO was uh, indicating. Um, we oft draw comparisons with places like White Rock and stuff like that. So, I mean, let's let's get out of the CRD and have a look at uh, maybe what some other similar sized communities are doing in, in this regard to help us establish our policy. Uh, so I'm in favor of this and I see Cynthia's back. So uh, back. Okay, uh, Stuart. And then I would like to uh, call the question uh, so we can get on with the, the next well, slide. Let Cynthia finish. Oh. Now that Cynthia? She's back. Yeah, I'm back. I don't know what happened. My internet uh, kicked me out. And uh, I don't know. It was weird. Um, so, uh, sorry, just uh, are we still on the same question? Yes, we're, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I remain, uh, I guess, very concerned that uh, this whole system isn't working terribly well for me and I don't feel like <clears throat> the community is engaged at this point. Uh, so as long as we're going to carry on <clears throat> not um, recognizing uh, the community interest in it um, and using just vague averages rather than real facts, I'm going to remain opposed. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, you know, I, I I would take a bit of an issue in that I think uh, all of council is interested in um, in the impact on uh, on the on the general public, and uh, unfortunately, that these are the times we are living in because of the circumstances that that have been uh, dealt to us uh, thanks to uh, COVID nineteen, and we are trying our level best to absolutely include everybody and recognize that there may be hiccups from time to time, but uh, certainly we recognize that the, the business of the city must move on and it's not an excuse to delay stuff, but uh, that, you know, that's, that's just my opinion. Um, I don't see any, uh, any further hands, so I will call the question and ask for you to raise your virtual hand if you are opposed to the motion that staff be directed to return with a draft uh, tax policy for their consideration. So um, I see, I see two opposed. Gordy, yeah. uh, sorry, Gordy. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would like to, unless you've got something new, Stuart, I would like to actually call the question. Yeah, I, well, I was just going to suggest that uh, with what we've done tonight, we sort of established significant tax policy for this year. Perhaps we could just put a date on when we'd like to get this report back on the tax policy. Um, 
I was just going to suggest that we should ask for the third quarter of this year to have uh, staff's recommendation on a tax policy to discuss in plenty of time before next year. Okay. Uh, Mayor Martin, I believe you made the motion. Are you uh, okay with the friendly amendment? I am. Okay. Uh, so with that friendly amendment to have this um, uh, report on the draft tax policy in the third quarter of this year, uh, I will now call the question. Uh, those that are opposed to the motion, raise your hand, virtual hand. I see Councillor Day is opposed. So the motion passes. Okay, so I will move to item 4.2, 2020 to 2024 draft financial plan. And I'd invite uh, Jen Hepting, the manager of finance to introduce the item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one moment and I will share my screen. Okay, so tonight is intended to be a continuation of budget deliberations uh, that started earlier this year. Um, I'll just take a, a brief moment here um, to recap and then we'll, we'll get into um, some, some tax scenarios for consideration. Um, to date, committee has reviewed the draft financial plan in its entirety, um, primarily between the February 18th and February 25th Committee of the Whole meetings. Uh, the original intention of tonight's budget meeting um, was to review the draft financial plan in summary and, and just highlight any updates or changes that came out of previous committee meetings. Um, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, Staff anticipate that tonight will now be focused on discussing additional taxation scenarios um, should committee wish to recommend changes to council. And on that note, we are seeking that should committee wish to recommend any changes to the draft financial plan that committee make those recommendations tonight. Staff will then incorporate any changes into the draft financial plan bylaw that we intend to publish next week as part of the April 27th Council Agenda Package. So as it stands, um, we are hopeful of bringing forward the draft financial plan bylaw um, to Council on April 27th. And we anticipate that we may require a special meeting of council in order to adopt both the financial plan bylaw and the tax rate bylaw by May 15th. I'll just pause. Are there any questions just based on that, that quick recap and wh where we're at in our 2020 budget timeline? Um, Thank sorry. you, I see Michael. Yeah, I just had a question about that May 15th date. I may be getting confused about what the province is doing uh, versus talking about, but I thought there was some talk of uh, delaying that date. Thank you for that question. Staff are aware, so the province um, has issued a couple of circulars. Um, they have amended our we have a number of items, statutory deadlines that are due by May 15th. Um, one of those includes approval of the prior year financial statements. The province has announced deferral of that um, due date this year. Uh, but in terms of tax rates, uh, we are still looking to have those adopted by May 15th. And we'll get into this in a bit more detail later on tonight, um, but ultimately, if we do not amend our property tax due date and we remain consistent with a July 2nd due date, 
staff require that those rates are set by May 15th um, in order for us to issue our property tax notices in sufficient time for our current property tax due date. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Stuart. Uh, Jen, I noticed that on your uh, process overview, sort of it went from tax rate review tonight, which I think we talked about a little bit, and then the draft 2020 draft increase in COVID considerations. Are those things we should be discussing before we get into the, the, de the nitty gritty of the financial stuff? Yes, no, thanks for mentioning that. Um, so the intention is that in red is kind of highlighting um, what we'll be looking at tonight. Um, so we will revisit where our 2020 tax increase currently sits, with, which is 3.52%. Um, we will also review um, impacts to the draft budget as a result of this, this current pandemic, um, both risks to the city's revenue sources um, and also potential scenarios to either defer or reduce the proposed tax increases. Um, and, and we will be going through that information tonight. And staff's desire is that should committee wish to recommend any changes um, that we receive that recommendation tonight. Um, and we will be providing information to aid in that discussion. So I guess, would seem to me we might want to know where we're going before we get further. I mean, I would think in, the, in these in these times and these considerations, we should be looking at a zero percent tax increase overall. Is that something that's feasible? We and will is it supportable be, by the rest of council? I guess is a question. And that's the discussion. This that is the discussion that staff is looking to facilitate tonight. Um, so we have prepared. Um, a scenario for committee's consideration that does result in a 0% tax increase in 2020. So I'm jumping the gun. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> no, not at all. You're, you're clarifying what we will be reviewing tonight. You're very pot, very kind. Kind of, kind of to put it that way, Jen. <laughs> okay. And uh, Councillor Day. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I'd like to, and, and maybe you already have it planned, and if so, I'm fine with waiting till you're planning to tell us about it, but I would like to know what the balances of the reserve funds are. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Those are stated, just bear with me. On page 75 of the draft financial plan. That will be a good reference for where our reserves are projected to be based on the draft financial plan. That we have Perfect. coming into tonight's discussion. Okay, I don't see any further hands. Uh... Cynthia, you're okay? Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to balance too many papers on too small an area. <laughs> so with that, I'll just take a moment to comment on the changes that have been made to our draft financial plan between what was originally presented at the beginning of budget deliberations in early February um, and the second version that staff published as part of this agenda. Um, so we have made a number of changes to the draft plan, um, primarily as a result of committee recommendations um, and also as a result of some improved budget information that we have received um, since we met in late February. So turning to our special projects, um, committee made a recommendation that we add um, a $10,000 heritage commission budget for heritage commission related project work. Um, that has been done to the 2020 draft plan. Um, in addition, staff have also put forward a development guidelines project. Um, and that is a project that is 
looking to span between this year and into next year. And the engineering standards and specifications, staff have pushed that project out from 2020 to 2021 um, and revised the budget to $60,000 for 2021. The city's capital plan has also been amended um, committee had recommended that the community garden greenhouse budget item be removed and that has been done. We had two 2021 construction budgets for both the Machosen Road Improvement Ben Homer to Cotlow and the Painter Road Improvement projects. Those costs of construction figures have been revised and I will clarify that the Machosen Road total cost of construction figure is 1.245 million um, that we will be splitting evenly over two years. The draft plan shows it as 2.245 million and we will revise that um, in the next version of the draft. Um, in addition, the Latoria VMP intersection capital project and the Allendale Works and Services capital projects, we have grossed up those project budgets to represent 100% of the estimated construction costs. Um, and we've had a corresponding increase in funding sources that represents the developer's contribution to those projects. With all of that said, um, I will comment, the current draft financial plan does not propose deferral of capital spend um, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, to note deferral of any of our special or capital projects would not result in a reduction in property taxation as these projects um, are all funded by way of grants or reserves um, or developer contributions. I'll take pause if there's any questions. Otherwise I'll turn to just a, a breakdown of where the property tax lift sits right now. I think you can uh, continue on, Jen. Okay, so we remain looking at a 3.52% increase to property taxation over 2019. Now 1.46% of that increase is in order to fund proposed service increases. So these are those new services that we highlighted as we went through the service plans. Um, and I will comment that this is the net increase to the cost of those services after we apply um, the city's new construction taxation revenue to fund, to fund those increases. We're also looking at a 1.06% increase. This is the increase necessary in order to fund existing service levels. Um, so in other words, it's the increase required for core contractual obligations, um, union contracts, and it is, it is offset um, by a projected increase in our core operating revenues, um, in particular, the city's PILT revenue, um, which we do still anticipate to benefit from that increase. Um, lastly, the city's sustainable infrastructure policy calls for an additional 1% in property taxation annually um, to set aside to reserves. And so that, that there is, is the breakdown of the proposed tax increase. Um, as it was introduced earlier this year in, in budget deliberations. So in the last few weeks, city staff, you know, we've gotten together and we've analyzed the draft financial plan in context of this pandemic. And we've identified um, a number of areas of risk. So in highlighting um, our revenue risk, we do anticipate a reduction in building and, and development permit revenue. Um, we don't have specifics. You know, we, we have estimated um, a reduction and, uh, and I'll bring the numbers up in a moment when we jump into the Excel scenario. I will comment on that note. You'll see that the impact on our budget um, 
is both commented as reduced operating funding and also reduced transfer to reserves. That's in part in recent years as the city has experienced a surge in building um, and development in the area, we have been setting aside a portion of that revenue to our reserve funds. Um, so with the projected decrease that we will experiencing, that we anticipate to experience, um, we will offset that decrease by a decreased transfer to reserves. Um, we will be monitoring building and development permit revenues closely this year, um, and we're gonna mitigate reduction not only by way of a decreased transfer to reserves, um, but also in related expenditure in those two areas. Casino revenue. So we receive approximately $300,000 annually um, from the View Royal Casino under a cost sharing agreement. We transfer that funding um, to our reserves. We absolutely do expect a reduction in the revenue we receive as the casino is closed for the foreseeable future. Um, and that too will impact our reserve transfers. We've mentioned investment income and property tax penalty revenue. Um, again, this, both of these two revenue risks just depend um, on some of the decisions that we make in the coming weeks, depending on whether or not we elect um, to change our due date and or to alter um, the property tax penalty that we levy. Um, currently we levy a 10% penalty the day following the due date, um, that may impact the revenue collected there. Um, and also, depending on if we adjust due dates, um, that may impact our cash flow, um, which in turn may impact the cash that we can set aside and invest. Um, and again, both of those factors would impact our proposed transfers to reserves. We did want to take a moment um, as well just to view the property tax increase in consideration um, with our, the city's service level um, and recognize that there are alternatives um, that committee and in turn council may wish to consider. Um, so if we maintain existing services, um, we do require an additional $150,000 approximately, which is the increase of 1.06%. Um, the alternative is to reduce existing services or fund that increase um, by way of an alternative measure, which could be a one-time funding from reserves. Um, similar thought can be with the increased services, um, action alternative could be to either defer the increase to a future year um, or abandon the proposed service increase or continue with the increased services um, and look to a funding alternative by way of a one-time transfer from reserves. You know, should committee wish to do this, staff will highlight um, that a one-time transfer from reserves will simply defer that property tax increase to a future year. Um, and lastly, the 1% the increase to specifically fund our sustainable infrastructure. If we elect um, not to levy that 1% increase, um, that will just, that will push out uh, our, our desired you know, timeline to, to reach our sustainable levels for replacing our existing infrastructure. Um, so it, these are just concepts to keep in mind um, as we review scenarios for consideration. And so with that, um, I'll take pause for any questions and then I will, will bring up um, an Excel document where staff have reviewed, um, one, the impact of the, the risks to our revenues, um, and also areas where committee may, may wish to um, defer expenditure in order to achieve a reduced 
property tax increase in 2020. Thanks, Jen. I'll uh, recognize Michael. And I bet she's on pause or on uh, mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> there you go. Again. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I have a fairly complicated question about page 19, the um, table you just dealt with. So when you say that if we don't do the increase in um, taxes this year, we will simply be deferring it. Um, I guess the alternative in the case of line one is if, uh, if we never do this tax increase, then that's a permanent um, setback in providing services. In other words, our services will um, in the future be um, reduced by that one year's worth of improvement. And with line two, um, it's a similar thing in that, uh, but instead of, uh, of the services being less, if we abandon that, they won't improve the way we anticipate. This is assuming we never actually add this 3.52 back in. Um, and then the 1% to reserve, obviously, we have to catch that up at some point in the future. Um, we are gonna have to, uh, um, replace old services, uh, so you can't escape that one. It, it, the way I've put that, I mean, am I somewhere close to the truth? Yes. Okay. Sim thank you. Simply put, if if we can, we if we choose to maintain existing services and we choose not to levy the one point zero percent tax increase required to fund those existing services we will simply be deferring that next necessary increase to a future year. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, Mayor Martin. Thank you. Can I please just get uh, through you to Jen? Can I just get a clarification? Let's just hypothetically say that uh, this committee chose to do everything that's on this page that's in front of us right now so that that we basically eliminated eliminated the 3.5 to lift um how does that fit into i'm trying to understand how how would that fit into the revenue risks that you've identified beforehand if if we do all this wor work is there do we need to worry about those revenue risks from a lift standpoint or we've established a lift for 2020 and it would be at zero if, if we decided that this is the direction we were going. That's a really good question. When we get into the detail in Excel, we will highlight for you the net impact of the identified revenue risk. And just based on the revenue risk alone, we do anticipate um, a 0.5% additional tax increase required. So before consideration uh, of other either operating expense savings or deferments, there is anticipated to be an impact due to that revenue risk. The majority of the risk to revenue is impacting our transfers to reserves. Thanks, Jen. I don't Thanks. see any more hands, so uh, perhaps just move into your, um, to the spreadsheet. Okay. So where I have highlighted right here on the screen, this is where we last left off. So last year, our financial plan called for $14.7 million in property taxation. Tonight, we're looking at a financial plan that calls for just over $15.2 million in taxation which drives that 3.52% tax lift 
or approximately $517,000. We have identified a number of line items, and this is, I should comment that this was our chief financial officer, you know, meeting with department directors. Um, in addition, you know, reviewing this draft plan with our CAO and identifying not only our revenue risk areas, um, but potential considerations um, that could reduce that proposed property tax increase. So we'll start by reviewing, we've identified, and again, this is estimated, you know, based on um, discussions we've had and what we're aware of right now. Overall, we've got approximately $690,000 in revenue at risk. The majority of that $614,000 is impacting our transfer to reserves. As Councillor Day asked earlier in the meeting, you know, right now we're projecting that we'd have an ending balance of approximately $27.7 million in reserves. Now that we've identified these revenue risks, that 27.7 would be reduced down to about 27.1. In addition, there's a potential net impact of $75,000 um, and I will take a moment and go through each of these line items. So revenue risk alone in ensuring that we have a balanced budget in place, we would be looking at not a 3.52% tax lift, but a 4.02% tax lift um, to account for this lost revenue right here. Um, our new construction revenue uh, we have proposed that this is to be funding either increased service delivery, where there's been demand um, for increased service delivery, or it funds transfers to reserves. Our revised role um, that was received a couple of weeks ago, we are looking at collecting approximately $430,000 um, we had previously estimated based on our completed role. Um, so there is a minor increase in revenue generation there. Spring cleanup revenue um, is included in the draft budget, approximately $17,000. This provides partial funding for the direct costs related with the spring cleanup um, program. Should committee wish to recommend that there are no fees in 2020, um, that foregone revenue would need to be considered. Development and engineering revenue. Um, again, we've projected a reduction in budgeted revenues. And down below, um, we have projected where we anticipate some expenditure savings um, because of delaying um, the rehiring of either a current vacancy um, or um, a projected, projected vacancy later this year. In addition, we had a number um, of new service increases proposed um, and we have identified some deferment of expenditure um, by way of deferring both the increases in policing and the proposed increases in, in fire services, deferring those to 2021. Um, and policing again, we would then defer the 2021 expenditure to 2022 as well. The draft financial plan proposes the mid-year hire um, of an engagement assistant. And we have proposed that that could be deferred another three months. Um, and defer that spend into 2021. The draft budget had also um, proposed additional expenditure to enhance the city's GIS function. Um, should that expenditure be deferred to 2021, um, that too would result in, in a $50,000 um, reduction needed for 2020. 
the proposed reduction in transfers to reserves um, have all been commented on with the exception of the road infrastructure program. This was a new capital infrastructure program that was proposed to start for 2020. Um, a annual taxation of $30,000 is intended to be set aside in reserves and the city would then draw on that reserve funding um, for one-off um, localized improvements throughout the city. Um, so should we defer the introduction of that program, that there would be a, a $30,000 savings. So overall, the net impact of those items um, that have been proposed for consideration could result in reducing the property tax increase from 3.52% to 0%. Um, now that being said, as we mentioned earlier, any deferral in expenditure um, will simply defer that property tax increase to a future year. So rather than looking at a you know, proposed four or 5% increase for 2021, um, you could potentially be looking at a 7% increase. And so with that, um, I will look to committee ultimately for discussion and for recommendation um, on whether or not any changes should be reflected in the draft financial plan that will form the bylaw that we plan to bring forward April 27th. Great. Thank you very much, Jen. Uh, I've uh, recognized Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a few comments. Uh, I, I love all this stuff. Uh, thank you so much, Jen. Uh, uh, I understand it. Um, I do believe that uh, uh, you know, these are unprecedented times in our community. And I don't think we've experienced anything like this. Uh, and because of that, we're, we're you know, forging new territory. Um, our, we're, we're impacted from one corner of our community to the uh, to the other and that includes both our residents residences and as we had a discussion earlier uh, about our small businesses and even medium-sized businesses so um, many of these people are out of work at this point in time and many uh, may be out of work uh, and lose their jobs altogether if businesses go out uh, go out of business so the more we can do to support our residents and our businesses I think the better off we'll be uh, in putting our best foot forward for recovery. Um, I personally believe that we should be minimizing taxes increases. However, I'm cautious because uh, I would hate to see a double digit increase uh, next year or the year after. So I think we do need to take a measured approach. Um, unlike other levels of government that cannot run a deficit. So it concerns me when I see that uh, it really is going to take a 1% uh, increase for us to remain in the black. So having said all that, uh, I think this is going to require some creativity on our part. I do think deferring stuff that we can defer into future years um, should be considered, but we do need to put the lens on it that uh, I think, uh, you know, a 10 or 12% increase in, uh, in the next uh, coming uh, year or two is going to be uh, an untenable position. So um, that concludes my comments, uh, really, Mr. Chair, but I do believe that uh, there's lots of great savings here that I see that we can, uh, we can uh, explore. And I do believe things like the infrastructure 1% increase that we could defer, push that out another year, because really we don't know how long the polypropylene pipes are going to last anyways. And <laughs> I think the risk is minimal. So uh, having said that, I, uh, I, I bring it back to the table and to yourself for, for further discussion. Great. Thank you, Dean. And uh, I'll recognize Cynthia now. Uh, thank you. I uh, really appreciate the, the hard work that's gone into the presentation here tonight. Um, the one, um, there's a couple of areas that concern me. Um, and 
and I'll just frame it by, um, you know, I don't, I don't think this is going to be over quickly. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, if history is any indication, the 1930s were um, really uh, hard on, on everyone. And in retrospect, uh, a lot of economists have predicted that, uh, you know, had governments acted in the past, um, in, the, in the 30s, uh, to provide some social safety nets, um, it wouldn't have been as bad. So hopefully, uh, rolling up our sleeves and getting right into it is um, boding well for the future. Uh, but that said, there's a couple of items that are on this list that do concern me, um, particularly uh, the, the fire service delay to the hires and also the RCMP, um, because what we're seeing um, over and over again is how important those um, uh, services are to our community. Um, so, so I'll, I'll preface it by saying those, those are two, um, things that I feel like this might not be the best time to be doing that. Um, and a couple of opportunities that I don't see on the list, um, I couldn't find my spot in my mass of papers here, <laughs> but uh, if memory serves me correctly, I think there's about $80,000 uh, in the budget for uh, geotechnical uh, investigations for Latoria Road, for example. Uh, and I think those could more easily be pushed off to the future uh, than some of these other things that impact the daily lives of our citizens. Um, uh, so when I was reviewing this, uh, our financial plan documents um, before this agenda came out, uh, I was looking at our five-year plan and particularly uh, Latoria and the intersection with VMP uh, they have big implications this year, but even bigger next year. And my concern is around um, knowing that this is a long haul to get through this, uh, that we look at next year as well as this year, because we can easily push stuff off for a year. Um, but uh, what happens when the year that follows is also a struggling year? Uh, we saw that in 2008, 2007 and 8. We probably weren't really recovering till 2010. Uh, so I, I really wonder, it, has there been any consideration to the next two years uh, in your deliberations? Mm, that's a good point, Cynthia. Jen? Thank you for that question. Yes, so we absolutely have considered the impact um, on what would be year two of this financial plan in detail. Um, years three to five, we have not looked at in detail. Um, by deferring the required tax increase to fund both existing and or increased services, um, we are looking at an over 7% lift in 2021. In addition, we have reviewed um, special and capital projects with a very minor exception for some of um, our team's labor works on some capital infrastructure. There is no property taxation funding for these projects. Um, so deferring Latoria Road geotechnical works, for example, um, that would not impact the, the tax increase um, that is projected to be funded um, by way of the city's reserves. Uh, if I could follow up then just on that reserve mm -hmm. funds um, issue, uh, I we've been historically in the position of, of having very low reserves and it was a real struggle to get back to um, uh, a better position for the city 
uh, we had some double digit increases uh, to get where we are today. So I'm very concerned about um, using the reserves uh, uh, and not having a plan to, to replenish them. Do you have a plan to replenish the reserves? On the, on the discussion of reserves, you'll note this is not a staff recommendation to use the city's reserves, which are intended for specific purposes um, to mitigate a property tax increase. Should committee wish to mitigate a property tax increase by way of a one-time transfer from reserves, we would absolutely need to factor that in um, to future budget discussions as to how we would replenish the reserves, um, which one of the, the methods would be by way of a, a repayment funded from ta property taxation. Okay, and if we um, weren't using the reserve funds, would there be uh, a different rigor applied as in, would we have to have a referendum? Another alternative um, is in part what's proposed before you deferring, so reducing core operating expense line items that will reduce the funding that's required. Um, but all that is doing is deferring that necessary property tax increase <clears throat> to a future year. Uh, I, I'm going to recognize Robert. I think he wants to step in here for the comment. Robert? Uh, thank you, Chair Logan. Uh, Councillor Day, you know, you certainly make an excellent point on the hard work that the city has done uh, to, to develop those reserves um, is, is laudable. The, the reality is uh, the right thing to do in the 20 and 40 and 60 year horizon is to set up the correct amount of funds to recapitalize our infrastructure assets. At this juncture, um, administration is of the belief that council is desirous to balance that policy objective of long-term future recapitalization against the short-term need to react potentially to an incapacity in local ability to pay. And, and so while there isn't a specific plan um, to uh, replenish any diminishments that were made in terms of contributions to reserves or actual um, collections from those reserves um, to fund any of these tactics, um, such a plan would need to be made. It really is trading kind of a, a short-term policy objective uh, of a diminished household capacity to pay against the long-term policy objective of setting aside the right amount uh, to recapitalize into the future. Certainly on uh, deferral of um, increases to service that were notional uh, 30 days ago, um, you know, council may need to consequently defer ones that were notional uh, to begin in 2021 or defer ones that were notionable to begin in 2022, for example. And so you, know, you might need to move everything forward uh, a year if you want to make room in the short term um, for this potential diminished capacity to pay. Administration just wanted to provide committee and their through committee <clears throat> options for you to move that forward. Very good, thank you, Robert. Uh, recognize uh, Michael. Uh, hi, um, I am not an economist. I'm a uh, long time uh, engineering person, but um, I believe that uh, all economic theory and practice tends to show that it's at times like these that governments should spend more money and not less, um, as indeed the, um, the uh, federal government is doing both here and elsewhere. 
However, we, we're not in a position to spend a great deal more, but I think we could do our part by carrying on um, as if this 3.5 uh, tax increase um, were happening, but funding that increase from reserves. And some reserves are intended for specific purposes and some are for fairly general purposes. And uh, yes, we went through uh, a very difficult time, um, a, I guess about uh, 10, 12 years ago. Um, and we came out of it. And in that period, we were able to build our reserves from uh, near close to zero, in fact, on the wrong side of zero, to um, where they are today, which is uh, quite healthy, I believe. Uh, though I stand to be corrected uh, if I'm wrong on that. Um, and uh, so uh, I think this, what we're talking about funding from reserves is, uh, I believe uh, somewhere um, less than 2% of our total reserves, uh, which were built up to this degree over, as I said, 10 years. So I don't think we'll have trouble replacing it over the next 10. Um, we'll have to be careful about that. Um, but I think right now we need to proceed with our improvements and services. Every dollar we spend causes employment somewhere and uh, we need to fund it from reserves because although we can't uh, go and have an unbalanced budget, we do have the reserves at our disposal. And I think we should use them for the, the kind of emergency that this is. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'll recognize uh, Mayor Martin. Thank you. Uh, I, um, I, I will just, first of all, just say what uh, I believe uh, or the, what I'm supportive of, and then I will, uh, I have one motion that I would like to just move, try and get this to move forward. Um, so first of all, uh, I think it's easy uh, for us to look at uh, deferring the 1% uh, to reserves in regards to the, uh, the infrastructure replacement uh, plan. I believe, you know, we certainly did not anticipate that we would be in a once in a hundred year uh, situation. I think none of us expected that. I mean, even in February, as we were building out our budgets, um, we certainly wouldn't have been planning for a... Uh, uh, for an increase of such, of, of 3.5 if, if we were at that point. So I think to defer the 1% would be an easy um, uh, thing for us to do. And I think it's an appropriate thing to do because we are, we are in a very, very um, difficult time for a lot of families right now. There's a lot of families who are really struggling and really hurting. And, and I think it's, it's important that we message out. Unlike the provincial and federal governments, as, as uh, our finance team has said, we can't run a deficit. So, I mean, clearly we should be spending more. I agree with Councilor Baxter that in the ideal situation, we would be putting money into the economy, but unfortunately we don't have that ability to borrow um, against that. So uh, what it's important for us to do is to try and uh, minimize our cost to our homeowners and to our residents as best as possible. Regarding the increased services of the 1.46, I am certainly not a fan of, of looking at reducing those, uh, especially for police and for fire, but I think we have to. I, I think that's just the reality of, of where we're at right now. I think if we, we asked our residents, um, would they prefer to have one more police officer or would they prefer to try and keep their finances afloat in their own household? Uh, I think we know what the answer is going to be there. Um, I'm going to, uh, so I'm actually going to be, uh, supporting that we, we look at reducing all the increased services, uh, and bringing that to a zero for this year, uh, regarding the maintaining the existing services. I don't think this is also a time for us to be, uh, to, to be cutting back, um, to, to actually, to reflect what Councillor Baxter was saying. And I would actually be supportive of us, of us, um, funding that through reserves, reserves, are there uh, for uh, unexpected events, for these one-time events. We're not, you know, if we're not taking money out of reserves now for COVID-19 to try and help us, 
um, in the short term, I'm not exactly sure when, when we would consider doing that. I think this, this is the most appropriate time. When there's an emergency, you step up and you try and make it. Uh, I also understand that there's a concern in regards to that that would be a higher reflection in, on the 2021. We don't know what 2021 is going to look like right now. I don't think it's uh, this... I, I am the biggest person when it comes to forecasting out, looking five years, 10 years, 25 years, 50 years down the road. Uh, that's, that's who and what I am. And I, I don't think that this moment in time where we are right now in COVID-19 2020 is when we start forecasting out five to 10 years <clears throat> from now. What we do is we address the problems that residents are, are experiencing at the present time. Um, so saying all that, I would like to make a motion, Chair, uh, just so that we could start this. And I would like to make a motion that uh, for the 2020 budget, we defer uh, the 1% to reserves in regards to the infrastructure replacement plan. And I would, I guess I would look for help as well from staff if, if that's not the exact wording that you need. Okay, I think, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Martin. I think we get the gist of that, the understanding. Uh, so I'm going to um, clear the hands right now. And uh, since there's a motion on the table, so uh, discussion on the motion. If you could uh, raise your virtual hand. Uh, I'll recognize Doug. And I bet you you're muted. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Chair Hogan. <laughs> there you um, go. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's uh, I, I agree with uh, everything you said there, uh, Rob, on the motion. Um, I guess my biggest fear right now is that, uh, you know, the, the one thing that you get an opportunity to do during these times right now is do a lot of walking. And uh, I, in my neighborhood isn't particularly affected as much as the neighborhood right behind me. And uh, I get stopped by a lot of people. And, you know, we'd have to absolutely be tone deaf if we even consider, I, this is my opinion, just from what I can gather, uh, that um, a, a tax rate increase would be appropriate. It just, it just doesn't make sense uh, for all the reasons everybody has already stated. I mean, we, we can't carry deficits. We're not the federal provincial government. Uh, so, and, and I, 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 this is my biggest fear. Everyone is talking about like this is going to it's going to come and it's going to go away and we're going to get this recovery like you wouldn't believe. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. It's not going to be this V shape. It's going to be a big U and it's going to take time and everything has to be planned. I mean, our whole paradigm is going to have to change a little bit here. So uh, I, I mean, I could sit here and say um, it's, 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 uh, you know, tax increase or not. It, it didn't really bother me one way or the other, but, you know, I, I'm really listening to what our, our, our constituents are saying right now. And uh, to me, I, I, I'm going to support uh, a 0% increase, period. Um, and uh, uh, I, because I, I mean, some of the things I haven't even seen in the expenses that are being cut are, you know, things that are what I call discretionary. For example, we I think we agreed that everyone gets a five thousand dollar travel thing, or training, or whatever it is for all the councils. I mean, to me, that should be cut zero. Bang. There's a lot of there's a few things in, like that in the budget, and those are the type of things that I think should just go away because it sends the right message. And uh, to me, right now, uh, for us to even even consider uh, a tax increase. Uh, considering where the situation of some of our residents, I'm not saying that all are in this in this situation. I mean, for all you know, to lead the way, I, I wouldn't even care. I, I wouldn't even care if I gave back my salary that I make from the city. I mean, that's how I look at this right now. So uh, my point is, is that I'm going to support a zero percent increase. Great. Thank, Thank you, Doug. Uh, I got Stuart. And I bet you he's muted too. I was. I oh, was. There you go. <laughs> so I, I guess I got a fair bit to say, and and then it relates close enough to the mayor's motion that I'm just going to go on here. Uh, firstly, you know, being an old guy, seen a number of these 
um, slowdowns over the years. You know, 81 was, was, was really brutal. 95 was tough. We had, uh, you know, the dot-com bust and the, and the 2008, the financial crisis and all this stuff. And it does percolate through the whole society. And as, as a young guy, it was always, oh crap, this is awful. I can't wait till six months when it's back to the way it was and life goes on as normal. But it never did. It always came out different. It was always, it was always a change. And, and I think we have to realize that. And I think that sort of flows from what, you know, Councillor Day was saying and, and, and the mayor and, and Doug, that, that there's going to be a new normal coming out. And so when we talk about, well, we'll do this stuff and then next year we'll have to bump it up so that we can get back to on the track we were on. I, we have to be real cautious about that. The, the track we were on is not the track we're going to be on. Um, you know, and, and the, it's going to take six months and then it'll be back to normal. Though That's not the right approach here. We have to tighten our belts. Uh, we have to um, really be um, almost savage in what we cut. You know, we have to, be, we have to uh, trim the sails and, and be ready for tough times for a while. And, and again, when I say that, and I look at, at, at what we're saying in the spreadsheet that we've got here, which, which is a great first start, I go, but, but I don't want to cut police and I don't want to cut fire services. Um, the, you know, some of these new staffing positions, I think we have to look very carefully at those and say, you know, yeah, it's going to be a little bit tougher. We're a little bit bigger city this year than we were last year, but, but maybe we have to just get by somehow. And, and, you know, uh, frankly, I'm the one who's always yapping on the sustainable infrastructure fund that we haven't really figured it out yet and haven't really come as a decision as a council, but I still think we should have one. So I, you know, I would have, uh, my preference would have been maybe leave half of it in and find the savings elsewhere. So I guess what I'm coming around to is, is asking uh, Jen and, 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 and Alan is, you know, how, how, um, how tough were they in, in going around looking for savings? And, and uh, you know, you presented a list of savings here, which gets us to the number, but it's got some issues to it, in my opinion. Where else can we be looking to, to create the savings that are needed to get to the 0% tax increase? That's, that's my concern. I don't know if that's appropriate to ask now in the middle of this motion or not, but, but that's kind of where I think we need to go to. Yeah, and I, I, thank you, uh, Stuart. And I, I think I've probably been a little bit liberal uh, with, uh, with you and Doug. <laughs> Uh, so I, I would like to uh, to bring us back to actually the motion on the on the one percent uh, deferral of the uh, the infrastructure replacement plan, and then we can get into that discussion about uh, how hard the savings were uh, were sought and that sort of thing, um, if if that's okay. Uh, so I I don't see any more uh, hands, so I will call the question on uh, deferring the one percent. Um, infrastructure replacement plan. Uh, so by a show of electronic hands, those opposed? I don't see anybody opposed, so that item will be deferred. Okay, Jen, did you want Jen to- Jen here, uh, may I, yeah, Jen here, just a quick comment. The policing and fire um, hiring deferral, this, both of these line items um, were based on conversations, um, both with Inspector Preston and with our fire chief. Um, so for fire services, this is not proposing um, a deferral of existing fire service delivery. This is proposing a deferral of the increase in fire service delivery, um, specifically the draft financial plan um, proposed the hiring of two additional career firefighters, and we were going to phase that hiring in between 2020 and 2021. Um, we are now proposing um, that we defer that new hiring to 2021. Um, and I'll allow the, the fire chief to elaborate if he so wishes, but in conversations, um, given uh, the current pandemic that's underway um, and the desire to have, you know, a, a thorough, comprehensive hiring process, um, the support is there to defer this increased service to next year. 
Thank you, Jen. Uh, now, just to speed us along a little bit, and I recognize that uh, I've only got 21% left on my iPad. Uh, there was some discussion about uh, uh, and some interest about a 0% increase. Uh, so what I would suggest is uh, if, if someone wants to um, make a motion to that effect, then we can start there. Um, and uh, if it passes, then, uh, then we go no further. But, uh, uh, but at least we'll know where we stand. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll recognize uh, Mayor Martin. Thank you, I, I will make a motion. Okay, so we have a motion that uh, we proceed with a 0% tax increase. Um, on the uh, motion, I see Councillor Day, your hand up, is it on the motion? Yes, it is. Okay, I'll recognize Councillor Day. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I can support the motion, uh, oh. but not if if we achieve that through uh, the use of reserve funds. So it, I, I'm asking for clarification, is the motion to use reserve funds to achieve the 0% tax increase? That, uh, that was not my intent. My intent was just that the, as, from a principal standpoint, council uh, is working from that philosophy. May staff have a quick comment? Uh, absolutely. On that, the scenario before you for purposes of 2020 does not propose the use of reserve funds to achieve a 0% tax increase. Committee may wish to consider the deferral. So ultimately this would be a reduction in core operating expenses as highlighted before you. We've already received a recommendation to defer the contribution of the 1% in recognizing the revenue risks. We've highlighted that impact on our transfers to reserves. So in other words, we could achieve the 0% in 2020 by a reduction in our core operating expense as highlighted here and in deferring the initiation of the road infrastructure program, um, which proposed an annual budget of $30,000. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Councillor Day, you had a follow up? Yeah, just uh, I would like to know, Jen, what, um, what the impact is on 2021 then. So we know that if we do a 0% tax increase this year, We've talked about it, pushing it off to next year. Uh, so do we have uh, an idea of how to manage next year? Um, knowing that we don't have, you know, our crystal ball is very cloudy at this point in time, uh, but just an idea uh, of how we will handle next year. Thank you. All things remaining the same in terms of the proposed level of service should we make this decision this will defer the property tax increase to 2021 and beyond 2021 tax increase is approximately seven percent now that being said um, we review our financial plan annually um, and as has been mentioned, we, we don't know um, where things will go. In terms of this year's operations, we will be monitoring operations very closely um, and providing updates by way of our quarterly reporting. Um, and th there's gonna be a number of factors that are going to need to be considered, to be considered um, as we determine how and when we implement these service increases and or the necessary increases to fund our existing services. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jen. I'll uh, recognize Robert. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair Logan. Uh, I'll provide a, a comment on the last comment and then, uh, and then a recommendation um, for, for process. So um, with respect to, as just described, the 2021 tax increase would have many of the items that you may defer tonight um, beginning in that tax year. If six months or nine months from now or 12 months from now, um, the, uh, the economic recovery is more U-shaped than V-shaped as described by Councillor Kobayashi, then decisions to defer again would likely be before you and or uh, decisions to change other service levels um, would likely be before you. Um, and so while it does say seven now, that's seven presuming uh, that you move forward with those increases in service levels um, a year from now, which is probably uh, an assumption th um, that is unfounded if uh, the recovery was delayed. From a process perspective for the conversation this evening, it would be helpful, I believe, if council were to either collectively or individually uh, consider motions on line items 27 through 31 and then line item 35. If you were to consider those as individual motions or to consider them collectively, um, in their collective, they would take your uh, tax rate increase to zero if you made them um, all together. But I recognize that uh, there are various opinions about uh, the support um, or not for each of them. So it may make more sense to look at them individually. Thank you, Robert. Uh, recognize Stuart. Uh, thanks. I was just going to ask uh, Jen to go over again the um, the savings, the core operating savings, and the deferred the GIS. It looks like you're highlighting them in yellow. Um, if all of those were implemented, that would balance the. Um, 3.52 percent tax increase, but not the potential revenue risks. Is am I understanding that correctly? No. If all of these are implemented, they will achieve the deferral of the required 3.52 percent lift to a zero percent tax lift in 2020. But not the revenue risks? It will include the revenue risk. So of the $689,000 in yes. revenue that's estimated to be at risk today, $614,000 of that is budgeted as a transfer to reserves. So that will reduce our reserve transfer. Okay. So, we'll, so what we're saying is we're, we're likely if we assume those revenue risks come, come through, what we're saying is we will likely reduce our revenue, our transfers to reserves by $614,000 and we will defer costs for the 500,000 or whatever it was, the 3.52%. The Correct. Okay, so it's a million dollar decision we're making here. Although the 614, I guess, happens whether we like it or not. So there's nothing we can do about that. Okay. Correct. All right, Another, thank you. Yeah. We've already received the recommendation. We're now considering a 2.52% tax increase or $367,000. Um, as our CAO mentioned, it, it may be um, easier to consider each of these line items. Um, these are options that staff have put forth that would reduce the need for a tax increase this year. So these ones, we're, we're talking about the ones in yellow, is that correct? So that's 362 plus 50,000, which is, I guess, the 413. And then we've already slashed 150, so that's the 560,000. And is that the 3.52% or is that in, in excess of 3.52%? It's approximately the 2.52%. Which we've is the 413? We've already 
reduced our lift, this green highlight is showing that we, we will not tax that $150,000. I know, correct. So, so, but here we have, if, so our property tax lift was going to be 517, is that what it was? At 3.52%? Yes. Okay. And then if we go down, can we go down to the yellows again? So then we're at 413, correct? Plus 30. Plus 30, so 440 plus 150, so 590. Yes, and then okay. we offset that by the revenue risk of 75,000. That brings us right back to the 517,600. Gotcha, thank you. Sorry to be anal, but. Not at all. Way I was born. <laughs> okay, uh, recognize Michael. Yeah, I, I just wanna repeat that I, I think um, reducing our spending is the wrong thing to do in these times. Uh, it's recessions are caused by the reduction in private spending and the antidote is actually increases in government spending. And the only way we can increase our spending is by taking it from reserve. However, um, if everybody else is set on this course, uh, I wouldn't intend to vote against it because I think that sends the wrong message. Um, but I do, I do think we're going about it the wrong way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robert, recognize you. Thank you, Chair Logan. I think it's important uh, to articulate that uh, the discussion this evening is with respect to our operating budget and administration um, is keenly aware that fiscal stimulus as a response uh, to this economic contraction and as a tactic for governments to help stimulate the economy is likely and that administration is going to accelerate our capacity to move forward with capital projects should that fiscal stimulus materialize and or should um, interest rates stay uh, at the rate that they are. And so administration will, outside of the traditional budget cycle, um, accelerate our process to identify um, and pre-plan capital projects such that we are ready to play our role in the fiscal stimulus response uh, to our recovery. Great, thank you for that uh, clarification, uh, Robert. Uh, I'll uh, recognize Dean. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple points. Uh, to Michael's point, um, I say we are doing our part. Uh, unlike several other communities, we're, we're not laying anybody off. So we are continuing to contribute to this economy and keeping our staff employed who are in turn spending money in the community. Uh, so I, I think, again, we are, we are doing our part uh, as we move forward here. Um, now, just a question uh, to help me understand for uh, Jen or whomever, but uh, <laughs> if we make these cuts as suggested to zero out the budget increase, what does that do to the 1.06% bump that was necessary just to keep us in the black? Is that factored in or is that something separate? As it stands right now, um, if we choose to reduce our core operating expenses, that 1.06% will in turn reduce. There's okay. a couple of alternatives. We either maintain the core expenditure and, and tax for that core expenditure. We reduce that core expenditure and reduce the tax necessary, which is in part what's being proposed right here for the building and bylaw and development services, or we maintain that core expenditure, we tax based on prior year, 0% tax increase, and then we draw down on our reserves to fund the necessary increase. Um, a comment I heard um, earlier was to not propose the use of reserves to fund that necessary increase. So an alternative for consideration um, is that we would reduce core expenditure 
in these areas as highlighted, that would reduce um, the proposed core increase in 2020. Um, and then again, this would be reviewed um, for 2021 budget deliberations. The expe staff's expectation is that where there is a temporary decrease in core, um, that that would need to be um, increased next year. Okay, so I think I have that. Uh, we make these reductions to keep us at 0% for this year and factored into those reductions, uh, we'll be able to cover the 1.06% or the 153,000 uh, either through reductions or tapping into some reserve funds to maintain existing services. Is that right? Or are we gonna see a net reduction in services? We're not gonna see a reduction in service level. What we are proposing is delaying the rehiring um, of either current vacant positions um, or projected vacancies later this year. In the next year's budget, we would be bringing forward a budget that represented the full cost of that core service delivery. So you, in that sense, that is a true deferral of the necessary tax increase for maintaining the core service delivery. Um, where it's an increased service level um, that yeah. we're proposing the deferral sure. of, as was mentioned, we will be reviewing um, these service levels. You know, it, it certainly isn't um, staff's intention that we expect that any deferral of increased services will automatically occur in 2021. Um, this is something that, that we will be reviewing um, throughout this year and, and into next year's budget deliberations. Okay, uh, thank you, I appreciate that. And I appreciate that uh, you're looking to us to take some decisions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I am looking forward to uh, going through each one of these line items as far as the uh, deferrals go. Uh, just uh, my personal pet peeve, uh, we, the inspector has asked us for another body this year. We did agree to it. Um, he did ask, you know, for a reason, and it was out of necessity. And I don't think uh, that we should be pushing that back uh, too many years. I, I think we can maybe float this for the six months to 2021, but I'd hate to see that new hire for the policing uh, of our community, which is a core service, uh, safety in our community. Uh, I wouldn't want to see that pushed back any further. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Robert. Thank you. To add uh, a little bit of further information to Councillor Jansen's question, I think on the, and I'll use line 27 as an example, on the building and bylaw delay rehire, when we speak about a reduction in core services, we, we believe we have the capacity to do that because we're up under the belief that there's going to be a slowdown in the volume of work within that team. And so we are not reducing core services in order to uh, save uh, taxpayer support of this position. We are reducing services in this example because of the belief set that there's going to be less work. And if a year from now um, that holds, um, then kind of that discussion would occur at that time. But we're, we're trying to, to match our service delivery, even within our core services, the community need. I, I appreciate that. Uh, and the only thing I would add is that uh, the delivery of safety in the community is counterintuitive to uh, economic. Uh, um, I mean, uh, we all know as there's an economic downturn, there is an increase in uh, crime rates. That's factual. And that's uh, very much uh, uh, stands that withstands uh, scrutiny over time. So I do believe that we do need to uh, sincerely consider uh, augmenting our current complement of officers as soon as we possibly can. Thank you, uh, Mayor Martin. Thank you. Uh, it's my understanding we have a we have a general motion out there which is a zero percent, and I would uh, encourage the chair to call it. Um, uh, a question on that. The the if, if uh, regarding line twenty seven through basically all of those lines that 
employee uh, hiring deferrals. We need to either move on and start talking about these things and specific line items and let's um, let's address them or, or, or address it as a group if we're supportive or not supportive of that. For myself, I know I'm very supportive of basically deferring all of the employee hire uh, until 2021. And so uh, I, I, would, uh, I would like to um, have us move forward. So uh, saying that- Thank you. So I have no further hand. So there is a motion on the floor made by Mayor Martin earlier that uh, we move to a 0% a tax lift. Um, I will call the question now. So if you are opposed, please raise your virtual hands. I'm not seeing anybody opposed to the motion. So the motion passes. Um, and uh, Michael, I uh, recognize your, your hand. Yeah, uh, so I'm just considering a further motion and that would be regarding the, um, the effect of what we've done taken with what we did earlier in regards to the change to the uh, business tax. So I'm asking the question right now, have we effectively zeroed the net increase in taxes overall? And will that therefore result in uh, a decrease in uh, business taxes and a slight increase in residential taxes because of the earlier motion? I, I think you're, that's a valid question. I think you're bang on, uh, Michael. Uh, Jen, I can confirm that. It's Alan Ayer. Or Alan, sorry. Yeah, no. uh, correct, um, provided everything else um, stayed consistent. The only thing we would add, obviously, with your taxes are components, including CRD, education, et cetera. Uh, on a positive note to the businesses, um, the education amount will be cut in half. So I think if we're looking at total tax bill, we don't want to forget that. Internally, just with Callwood, yes, if nothing else changed, there would be a slight reallocation amongst those two classes, and the net increase would be 0%. Hopefully that answers what you were asking. Okay, uh, Michael, did you have a follow up? I see your hand go up again. Yeah, as I say, I was considering a motion. So um, I've got the answer to my question. And I think we have not therefore achieved um, the intent of an absolute zero increase in taxes to the average homeowner. And I put forward a motion to achieve that, which is that uh, essentially we provide funding from reserves in order to make that adjustment to achieve a residential 0% tax increase. Okay. Does staff have that motion? Um, Alan? Excuse me, Chair. Were you clear on that, uh, that motion that Michael put forward? Yes, the impact then of that, it, just so I'm clear, is moving that anticipated business reallocation of 120,000, you're saying a further reduction of that amount. Um, and this might go back to the original, the last uh, agenda item here where we were trying to defer the business item to 2021 to avoid that impact on the residents. But if you're saying, having the residential tax at zero, we would need to find that additional 120-ish thousand from the earlier approved motion. Right, so what, uh, what uh, Michael is saying is that that, uh, uh, that tax shift from business to residential will be funded through reserve. That's what the motion says? Okay, for so yes, we're clear on it. Yeah, for 2020. Uh, so this, uh, Robert. Can, uh, right. thank, you, thank you, Chair Logan. I get, I have a, a couple of comments. One, I believe on the latter point, um, it I'm is, it is 240,000. It's the combined business tax shift 
with the light industrial and recreational nonprofit shift, I believe those will stack. And so I'd, I'd want Alan to comment on that. Um, but I think more importantly, what council has done is notionally pass a philosophical approach that we need to get to a zero um, budget lift, but you haven't, uh, we haven't yet um, gone through the process to make the motions of where those savings are going to occur to help us get there. And so depending on how that goes, uh, that could influence um, uh, the current motion on the table in terms of getting the remainder to get residential to zero. Okay. Uh, Doug? Oh, <laughs> that was uh, Michael stole my point. That's exactly why I voted against it. Um, it was for this reason, because I thought if this 0% tax increase was, was to go through, then we were debating a moot point at the time. And that's why I thought we, we could defer. I mean, the other option on the table is instead of trying to take it out of a, a reserve fund is just defer to what staff had recommended starting in 2021. Uh, that's, that's all my point was. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I, I, I understood um, uh, Robert to say that uh, we need to pass the specific motions to change specific budget items before we deal with my motion. I'm certainly willing to see the motion deferred until we've done that. Hey, thank you. Uh, I just want to get some clarification then, uh, Robert, Jen, or, or Alan. Um, my understanding was when we were looking at a 0% uh, tax increase, we were basing that on the information that was presented to us, uh, including Jen, what you've highlighted in the yellow. So I wasn't under the impression that we're, we were going to go line by line because then obviously that 0% is kind of mute. Yeah, Jen here, I'll comment on that quickly. There are a number of ways we can achieve a 0% tax increase. We can maintain the core budget as proposed and transfer from reserves in order to mitigate that tax increase. We could reduce some of our core or new operating expenditure, which is what the scenario before you proposes. Um, how, what depending on what committee specifically recommends that will impact how the draft financial plan is brought forward. Um, in addition, just a comment on the 0% tax increase. As we've mentioned, we have a number of levies on a typical residential property tax bill. Um, it's not just, you know, the municipal levy and the levy on behalf of the other jurisdictions. We also have parcel tax levies. We also have our sewer user fee, um, various factors driving those levies. Um, so, you know, as, as you've heard from staff, maybe in years past, it's to keep in mind that the average resident may not experience a 0% tax increase, despite the fact um, that the city did not raise proper, our property taxation. Right, uh, that's a good point. And I, I guess I would just caution uh, committee that you know, staff have done a really good job coming up with these, um, these items to scale back on to achieve a 0%. And I, you know, I just am wary, uh, given the time that we are gonna get into a line by line type of um, examination. Uh, recognizing that we need to get these bylaws uh, dealt with uh, pretty quickly. So um, with that, I'll uh, just recognize uh, Dean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm picking up what you're laying down and what Jen's laying down too. And I'll put forward the motion that we uh, uh, <clears throat> put off as suggested by Jen, lines 27 through 31 and line 35 all the items that she's uh, highlighted in the yellow and including, I guess that is uh, 46 as well. So 27 to 31, 35 and 46. We'll do that in one bundle. Okay, so that uh, 
that brings a little bit of clarity, I guess, uh, to that. Uh, we've got a motion on the table. Um, if you I don't see any speakers, so if you're opposed, uh, please raise your hands virtually. <laughs> I'm not seeing any opposed, so the motion passes. Uh, okay, so seeing nothing else, Jen and Alan, uh, I'm assuming you don't need anything else for tonight? No, uh, one moment. So our next steps is we intend to bring forward um, the draft financial plan bylaw to the April 27th council meeting. Um, we will also bring forward um, any related updates from the province. Uh, we are hopeful uh, that we may receive word um, of additional you know, financial hardship support that the province will be offering. Depending on what we receive from the province, um, the city may want to consider an alternative tax collection scenario and we will bring forward options for consideration at the April 27th council meeting. Great. That is all from staff. Okay, thanks, Jen. And great job, uh, Jen and Alan. We really appreciate your work you've done tonight. It was a tough slog. Cordy? Yeah. Uh, oh, Michael, uh, I've got Michael first, then Doug, I do see your hand up, okay? Michael? Oh, you're on mute. Michael, you're on mute. <laughs> can, can we pick up my motion again now? Uh, we can, but, uh, but the motion that has, that, uh, just passed was to defer those items that I think you were wanting to, um, have funded from. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, my, my motion was mere only about funding the business tax reduction. Oh, gotcha. So my, my apologies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, your, your motion is definitely on the table. Can you, could you read it out again for me, uh, Michael? That the, um, I, I guess I'm gonna put it very simply in, in simple terms and uh, anticipate that the financial staff will turn this into reality. But the idea is to use reserve to eliminate any increase in residential taxes as a result of the reduction in business taxes. We do have a motion on the floor. Excuse me, Chair. Yes, Alan? Just to be clear, that was the business tax plus the other two adjustments, is that correct? Yeah, sorry, uh, business, light, industrial, and recreation, yeah. So the net impact of that would be approximately 240, I believe, just so we're aware that we would have to find in reserves, not the 120. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on the motion, uh, Councillor Day. Oh, it was me first. Oh, uh, sorry. Yes, it was, Doug. <laughs> uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to propose a, a friendly amendment to your motion, Michael. Um, and that is that uh, I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to take this out of reserve funds. And uh, I still would like to go back to the staff recommendation, which was to commence this in 2021. Anyway, just for your concern. I, um, sorry, I don't regard that as a friendly amendment. I regard that as a totally different. Model. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Councillor Day. Thank you. I just wanted to suggest because we're all, I think, trying to get sort of through slightly different ways to the same place. Uh, I was just wondering, Michael, if you would consider uh, making your motion uh, to ask staff to bring back some scenarios to achieve that, uh, because I'm uh, sensing there's some of us around the table who are 
sensitive to using uh, the reserves. Um, so, and, and there may be some um, other ways to achieve that uh, without using uh, the reserve funds or maybe in a more defined way that the, the reserve fund would be replenished by X, Y, or Z. Uh, but without micromanaging and, and trying to go line by line through the budget, it might be better to just ask staff to bring that back. Uh, because I think what you're trying to achieve is that the changes that we're making in this very difficult year uh, is trying to provide relief to both our businesses and our residents this year. Um, I, I thank you for, for that, but um, I, I go back to what Mayor Martin said, which was if we're not gonna use our reserves for what purpose, for this purpose, what are they for? This is a financial emergency on a scale we haven't seen in a hundred years. And a uh, little bit of help out of reserves to the tune of $240,000 will not materially affect our financial security. Good discussion. I don't see any more hands uh, up. Uh, assuming staff uh, are clear on the motion and uh, the committee. Stuart, did you fall over? We, we couldn't quite figure out how to put our hand up. <laughs> Um, just so we're clear then, it, and for everybody for full disclosure, this would then mean we start at 240 below for next year and our 7% could escalate uh, in the 10% range. We would have to do the calculation just so uh, we're clear on where that adjusts our foundation chair. Thank you. That would, that would be a known risk. Yeah. Okay. Risk. Uh, with those comments, I will uh, call the question. Those that are opposed uh, to the motion, please uh, raise your hand virtually. Oh. Uh, so mm -hmm. I do see uh, Stuart, Doug, and myself uh, am opposed. However, the motion passes. No, no, I'm opposed, but I can't get my hand to go up. <laughs> there we go. Oh. Okay, so <laughs> uh, Doug, did you take back your hand? Your, your, oh, there you are again, okay. So those opposed, uh, Stuart, uh, Cynthia, Doug, and myself. So the motion fails. Okay, uh, with that, uh, nothing else uh, is required. So the next meeting is uh, Committee of the Whole is Monday, April the 20th. So I will ask um, for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by uh, Cynthia. All those in favor are opposed. Raise your hands. Seeing none opposed, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>